This is a, a wealth of growers' knowledge. Thank you very much. Uh, without it, I, what I'd just like to make is a quick comment that uh, I agree that prevention is the key. And part of the prevention solution is through the controlling of environment so that you can not only uh, protect against pests and, and uh, insects, but through the health of the plant, through the health of the environment, you, you actually avoid those downstream problems. So if you were to uh, consider in the layout of rooms, the separation of zones, uh, and how they are controlled, you have a better chance of not encountering those problems. If they do hit. How often do you see like a harvest room right next to a mother, like a mother room, but if you're from agriculture, we call it a stock room because they're your stock plants, not mother plants, it's just cannabis. We say that, that's cute, I like it still. But like, the door will be open to your main genetics room of all of your future cultivars, and they're harvesting powdery mildew plants right next to it. Or in order to get to like a veg room, you have to walk through three flower rooms, which plants, like people, older plants have senescence, like they're more likely to be sick and contaminated, you can't spray things on flowering plants, you shouldn't. So, like, yeah, the design process is so correct. Uh, well, and then I guess the other issue that we're facing in California, for example, is sustainability. Um, the energy grid is being taxed heavily by all these indoor grows. So, what are what are these controlled environments doing to promote sustainability? Well, you're seeing the greenhouse industry is absolutely on fire in California. And, and if you can, and, and greenhouse is a big word, there's many, many levels of greenhouse. But if you can get, you know, positive pressure, exclusionary greenhouses in, that you're actually pressurizing the house itself and it's creating a situation that makes it hard for any insects to get in, you start to have these zones that are pretty safe. California, I think 10% of the power is going to cannabis production. And so they're really trying to get out of using it. And, and, and it's not just just using 10% of the power. When you're talking about producing a product, you really, I had a little lesson on the triple bottom line. And so it's a matter of you produce the product and you should take care of the situation around you, but the, the inputs are causing issues. And so if we're consuming hydrocarbons at a rate that's second to none in the US, then maybe we should rethink that process. And so that's where this the energy crisis is, issue comes in. And when you're talking about efficiency with supplementals, it's about five times. So I can use one-fifth the electrical power in a greenhouse that I can on a regular range because I'm able to use the sun, which is pretty beneficial, and relatively cheap. But we're in California, so we have a really good source of it. You here are going to have a little bit different situation. You're going to have to increase your overall lux by adding more lights to the grid. But ultimately, having the ability to use the outside environment like that and, and work with it, it's, 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 it's mandatory almost for most people. And for a lot of the California cultivators, it'll allow them to get repetitive cycles because the greenhouse can run throughout the entire season through many places in California. So I think you're, you're seeing an, an adoption of that technology at an incredible rate. And it, it, it's uh, pretty interesting to see it all unfold. The, the light deprivated, like the, the greenhouses, like you said, many types from like French demi looms to hoop houses to we use a lot of like metal buildings, steel buildings, like common old brands called Butler, like Butler buildings, like just those steel buildings, then they're fully enclosed, they have no windows, they have warehouse roof over parts of it on the north side, but then all of like polycarbonate net panels like over the roof to allow the sun in. But then you can actually do CO2 enrichment. Then you can actually like, you know, you think about farming again, like any farmer knows like the shortest day of the year is December 21st in, you know, Northern Hemisphere, like the sun's at about 30 degrees, 45 on the spring and fall equinoxes, 60% in the summer solstice. So the sun, like how much it's coming in is changing. So that shortest day of the year, you've got essentially really good high quality lights with PAR meters that turn on on an automated schedule to augment the light until the sun rises. The lights turn off, it starts to get dark around three in the afternoon, the lights turn on, then you have 12 hours of photo period dark light. June 21st, long days. Well, you might have curtains that close at 7 p.m. and then open at 7 a.m. So then you would have seven hours of light. Let's say it gets really cloudy in the middle of the day. These lights turn on at 10, 20% to augment the level of par that you want. And par is really important because our industry, thanks to High Times and others, considered lumens to be the most important thing to think about when it comes to lighting technology. Does anyone know lumens are what the human eye sees? The human eye is not a plant. Plants like par value. 
So you like you have to actually have your lights with PAR meters, not just using a lumen meter to walk around and see how bright and intense the light is. But then I've also seen growers with PAR meters that are supposed to be held upright, holding them like sideways, and then not getting the right readings, lowering their lights too much, burning their plants. But those sorts of like hybridized technology, when greenhouse is allowed, it's the way truth and light until we can just do large scale outdoor, but the security concerns are so big to protect our dandelions from growing and theft. So we have to set this high standard of like Fort Knox greenhouses right now uh, to allow the industry to, to think that it's okay actually that the sun can come into a building. But you know, the sustainability side, that's the main reason I got into this. It wasn't about business and finance, it's to use the business to finance the revolution, like to allow this plant to grow. Um, it was one of the stats that knowing that in, in order to generate one kilowatt hour, um, a typical flowering light for 60 minutes, according to the U.S. Department of Energy, it takes 2.1 pounds of coal to burn in order to generate that amount of electricity. So 12 hours, and you think, okay, that's over 25 pounds of coal per day per light when the sun is doing a better job than it outside. But when we actually ran all the energy models, we realized that to produce one gram of indoor cannabis on average in the United States takes over 22 pounds of coal to make one joint. And that's not the mercury for the light bulbs, that's not the metal for the hoods, that's not the air conditioning, dehumidification, construction, package and transportation distribution. That's just for a fake sun. With a greenhouse, you have your stock plants, some other plants, you're keeping them ready, you get your V1, veg one plants kind of ready, four inch pot, two gallon pot, and then you harden them off. I've seen growers from cannabis that try to grow plants outside the first time and take an indoor plant, put it outside at noon, the thing's dead in five minutes because it never had full spectrum light. So you have to get them ready. And like with shade cloths, and they put them out for five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, depending on how you do it, not just an abrupt transition. So it's not about not using any indoor power or any air conditioning. It's about like the appropriate use of those for the right phase of plant life. In Germany, if they don't allow greenhouse, if it's fully enclosed indoor models, you can still create highly efficient, sustainable models, but you are taking, like for like the cooling, the dehumidification, there, you are still gonna use a significant amount of energy. So how do you offset? It's not just about covering the roof with solar panels, that's a good start, but actually like having the roof with solar panels we saw in Nevada like, for the albedo effect, for that black for the temperature, was very different. So instead we did like white roofs, solar outside on the ground, and then flower at nighttime. Then you're not getting peak power usage and you flower from seven at night to seven in the morning when the power is cheaper. And then also you don't have a sun hitting your building and then add more heat inside and then try to cool it. Like, cause then you'd have a cooler nighttime air. So it's like that right question, of like using the right tool for the job. And I wish we could all just do outdoor and greenhouse everywhere, but I have only a few states in the United States I can actually do outdoor. California, Oregon, Washington, Colorado, a little bit in Michigan. Uh, Maine does it, but it's not on the books. So, it's, yeah, the right tool for the right job in the right market. i just jump on that one. Uh, I like that idea of the right tool for the right job. I think sometimes for, because we're, um, I'm most familiar with indoor growing, the people are looking for a home run or what is the biggest um, attract or what, what is drawing the most energy and often that's lighting. And I think that um, while there are so many options in lighting uh, that growers need to be really uh, selective in what they want to or how they want to grow. So choosing different lighting alternatives, whether they're HID or LED, uh, they really have to match up with what your objectives are for growing. And so uh, a savings in energy because of the selection of a lighting system may not result in a good yield or may not, um, the plant response might be different than expected. So any any savings economically may not be reflected in your production or your outcomes. So I think it's a, it, a grower doesn't always have to look for the home run, the big ticket items for cost reduction, but look towards optimizing production and really paying close attention through really effective monitoring and analysis of the operation and looking for where energy can be, is being consumed and how that can be improved. So through the use of controlling the environment and through great control systems that give you all the control and, and information you need, you can look at different aspects of, of uh, and different opportunities to save energy. Thank you. So we're going to open it up to some questions. Ago, <laughs> I would have like a 
a green like guys, it was called the Golden Lark, it came from California, like for hoop houses, like to do light deprivation. Like 10 years ago, I'm out there like fighting the wind, putting this big black curtain over a hoop house. I mean, I have acres that have been designed where it's like a person is not doing that. Everything is automated from like when the curtains open to like when the exhaust turn on to when the CO2 shuts off, it's all automated. And I looked to like the systems I know as a kid, Priva, Argus, Wadsworth, greenhouse control companies that have these master controllers or environmental controllers that are phenomenal. You don't just go down to your grow store and buy a hydro farm master controller and hook in everything and think it's gonna work, like something that's designed for the purpose. There are a lot of good startup companies for cannabis trying to do this more from the indoor model, but I love to look to like those outside big ag companies that haven't like really diversified in the cannabis too much or some of these new, better emerging package systems that actually have all of that automated. Because most growers, they're used to like hand watering. Like, well, you have to give the love to each plant grow. It's like, well, actually, like you're contaminating all of your rooms by using the same hose and different inconsistent watering strategies. So like automated fertigation, amazing. Maybe not for your, like, your vegetative plants, but in traditional ag, we don't water each corn plant you know, going down the road. There's a reason for this. So looking to like the big ag stuff and like the systems that exist from agriculture and then matching that to cannabis is really like where you're gonna come up with your home run solutions. The drip, the drip irrigation allows you to have a much higher efficiency. You, when you typically water, and, and that's, a, that's a big thing, for a few guys that aren't going organic and you're gonna go fertigation, that means you're gonna be using a, a, a food in the liquid. And when you're talking about hitting media with a, a, a fertigation source, typically they wet it and you end up having a lot of it percolate through. And so you might have 10, 15, 20% waste. With drip irrigation though, it allows the media to slowly absorb and accept it. And as the, the guys that are running the scene, they're gonna monitor runoff and they're gonna be able to adjust and, and, and through the growth curve of the plant, work on this fertigation system. And so you end up saving 20% on your, on your water and food just through drip irrigation, and you get a plant that's probably 15 to 20% healthier and larger because it never had to go through any type of inconsistencies. In a root zone, if you develop any dry pockets, in those pockets you lose the roots that are there. And so if I have, you know, 100, uh, say 100 square centimeters of space, and I use the whole 100 square centimeters, well then I'm, I'm efficient. But if I'm only using 80 of it, what happened to the other 20? And that's usually from poor watering techniques. And so when you pull plants out the pots and you chop them and take a look, you'll say, I got you. The ones that we did improperly. So drip irrigation is such a massive thing. And you use it in all facilities. It, I, I love it. There's enough drip irrigation in Humboldt County to wrap around the moon twice. We're the largest user of drip irrigation in the world. So it, it's something that's very important to use because there's, there's no way for you to actually keep these levels correct yourself. You, you need the tech. Do you have any questions for these guys before Ed comes up and gives his presentation? I didn't know where they're right now. Let's hear it again for this panel. It's been <laughs> incredibly important. So Ed Rosenthal will be uh, doing a presentation after our panel in case I uh, guess you know that. <laughs> Did you, did you have a question? Hi, hi there. Yeah, well, I wasn't always talking about biodynamic or organic methods for, mm -hmm. for growing hemp or cannabis. It all seems highest yield or industrial farming, but no one's talking about biodynamic or organic methods. I, we, are, we are. My farm's organic and so is my whole nursery. Um, and, and I'll tell you the truth, it was an evolution. What we found was that salt-based fertilizers on outside plants resulted in a pathogenic probability where the plants didn't have a bioprotective ability to resist pathogenic pressure. And so we started to switch all the nursery stock into, into organic living soil, where we build the soil, inoculate it, all the control on pathogens is through soil biology and through insects that we throw into the seams. And what we had was a radical change in the overall quality of the product, and we had far less crop loss so what I call salt-based gardening is obesity gardening, because really what you're doing is you're allowing the plant to overload. But if I do it biodynamically, I do it organically, then, then my, my microbial relationship with the plant is creating the uptake. And so I have plants that are exceptionally balanced. And I was saying earlier, some of the stuff I'm into is some of these new fungi and bacteria that we can get in, in concert. 
And so it lets me drive silicate levels through the roof so that I have an extremely tough epidural layer so that I'm not having these problems. And so for me, you know, I, I don't want to jam on salt guys, but that's not how you grow, that's not how you grow cannabis. It, it's really, it's a, it's a result of commercial desire. The plant itself seems to resist best, just like when you run them indoor for duration. I'll use that as an example. I'm somebody who collects cannabis, so I have a massive collection of, of cultivars for generations. Um, what I found through just trial and error was that they needed to go outside once a year to get a light inoculation, because what we know is that light isn't just energy, light's information. And so when you hold cultivars indoor under electric light only, I don't care what source, plasma, HIV, LED, induction, I have all of them, they break down. And so what we know is that the mother stock, plant stock, any stock, needs to have natural light and needs to have biology. And so whenever we take plants from people that are failing, we put it through a biological inoculation and a sun inoculation, and we can take cultivars that are considered duds, things that are no longer producing, and can return them to their full stock. An example would be, we have a plant that's producing only seven out of 700 cuttings, three of them strike. We get that back up to 100%. And so I get plants from virologists, I get plants from universities and scientists, so that we can play around organically, biologically, to find how do you get the plant to balance itself out so that you don't have to do all this extra work. So really, the, the push is big in Northern California, because when we wrote the laws for MRSA medical marijuana, we stipulated organic production only. So, you know, as we start to move forward, cannabis in California on the medical level will only be produced organically. Which is positive. Here, and here's a problem. I'm totally about organic. That's like my roots. That's what I believe. But we've probably got, what, 20 different languages in this room alone. So when we use a word, it's important to know its definition. And this is, this is the problem when it comes to organic, which I, I push for. And I, like, I know for a fact, like, organic is a USDA term. Owned, we cannot use it. So like my $20,000 sentence that I'll give you here, like that took us to, like, we cultivate our cannabis following organic methodology using certified organic products. Said the word twice, didn't say I was organic once. Like there's 68 pending lawsuits in Colorado that are coming out against like all of these organic companies saying they're organic but they're not certified. And, and from the senator this morning, you saw it's like federal government states, like states were able to get away with certain things now. You start playing with federal terms, it's dangerous. So. Biodynamics is really important, like natural is a word that's just greenwashed around, but biomimicry, like understanding plant dynamics of like molasses and kelps and all of these systems instead of like the salt based and the salt based, another problem with that is cannabis is an amazing bioaccumulator, like for actually like uptaking heavy metals like you've seen for the Ch Chernobyl studies from hemp, it's like it pulls up heavy metals from the soil and from the media. If you're feeding it salt based heavy metals, and they, your state or country starts to institute heavy metal testing, 100% of the time it's going to fail. We've seen that multiple times when you're actually using qualified competent labs to test this. So if you're thinking about the wave of the future for future like regulations coming, if heavy metal testing is a big deal, and you're using certain hydroponic or certain salt-based derivatives and not actually testing that medium, it could be a major problem. Not to say there's not some advantages, but Organic, the reason we haven't pushed for it as much on an international level is because our understanding is based on the U.S. term. Organic in the EU is very different, which is a much better, higher standard than actually organic in the United States. And true organic farmers are doing a better job than the organic certification, but as a kid, we couldn't even afford organic certification. It was 10 k $10,000. We couldn't afford it, but our products were like from the earth there, like never pesticides, even find the ones we could afford it. We did that. And that, that label means a lot on your packaging, on your marketing, your branding. But if you use it too early, you'll get sued. And then if you also say you're organic and you're not, like God, it's the mislabeling and product, it's major problems. But hold those standards even if you can't say that you are it. And like we can set the standard for the industry, but through my own self-regulation, but also the cost of production. Like you know, like for outdoor greenhouse, like organic-based production, I can produce cannabis for like $10, $20 a pound instead of like 983, like the nationwide average in the United States for like indoor. So like when you think about it from a business standpoint, like all these new technologies can make me all this money, but actually old technologies, like appropriate technologies combined with like bioscience with controlled environments, it's like, that's the balance that I beg cannabis to get to. It's not like 
we're all leaders in the space doing what we do, but we're only here. And it's like through these sorts of collaboration, more PhDs, more scientists, taking like Ed's wisdom from years and years and years and like merging this into like the new cannabis agriculture, which if we embrace agriculture, like we're gonna do far. If we keep fighting it, we're gonna keep having these problems. Okay, one more, one more. I was just gonna ask you guys' opinion on flushing. It's uh, an old world practice. Um, we're in the new world and I'm just interested in Get your thoughts on that. Um, you only flush salt base plants because the natural plant is going to buy a lot. In, in, a, in a natural biological system, the plant is sending out root exudates that stimulate uptake. So the plant tells what microbial population it wants to increase or decrease. And so as the plant goes through its life cycle, it's basically talking to the soil and it stops picking up nutrients as it stops needing them. So organic plants never need to be flushed because they flush themselves. But salt-based plants, you can flush that damn thing for three weeks and there's still going to be petrocarbon smoke on the end of it. And the bottom line is, that this is we're talking medical products here with better extraction, but as this product gets moved and moved, people become to become very cognizant of the product. And when one smokes organic cannabis or uses organic cannabis, then one uses chemically-based cannabis, even if it was flushed unbelievably well, you can tell the difference right now. And that's the problem, is that as we become more educated in what we do, we're going to become more picky, which means your buyers and, and customers and medical people will become more picky and knowledgeable. And so I, I look at the flushing process of let's wash it out, but no matter how much I've, and I, I've been doing it for 38 years, I was heavily involved in commercial commercial production, but using hydroponics. And we were trying to understand how do we remove any of these salts. And no matter what we do, we could never equal the organic product. I just couldn't do it. So I was running, I was running tests side by side. I couldn't get it to equal in terms of the quality of it. So for flushing, all you're basically doing is just letting the plant metabolize what's inside it. But you really can't get all of that out. You, I, I, don't, I don't think you can. From, from someone who's been doing this as long as I have, I just see a difference in the two. And we see some beautiful, beautiful indoor product, visually, into, you know, numerically, but there's a difference in experience, and at the end of the exhale, there's some hydrocarbon in your mouth, and you know it. And, and some, some growers, like... So some growers that actually do soil need to flush, and it's not, here's like the stoner stigma for a second, it's like, it's not that they're lazy, they just, they're using the wrong tool for the job again. Like, they got a warehouse, it didn't have floor drains, they started getting all these weird trays and tables, and they had to walk around with the shop vac and suck out water. So are like, well, let's just water the plants less, because we actually don't want runoff, because we'd have to deal with it. And then that... Like, is a major problem for like hydroponic systems and soil systems that they're not watering enough like to actually have runoff happen so the plant waste, those additional exudates can actually get bit down. So even in soil cultivation indoors, I'll see a lot of growers never have runoff and things just build up. So there is a time when like certain flushing can be beneficial for those sorts of producers. But if you design your operations with soil or if you're in like pots or outside in the soil, of course, like not a super need hydroponic world and some of those others like you can flush all day and those things are still still there but if you water appropriately and design a system just like an organism like we didn't make like we're deuterostomes biologically like we have a mouth we have a butt there's you know mono like a clam will eat and poop out of the same like entrance exudates a plant needs to get rid of its waste and like certain things it's not just the plant waste it's actually the waste from the bacteria and the fungi in the soil that can actually cause problems if you don't, the gravity, it kind of works all the time, goes down. If you don't have that process happening, and like cleaning that soil and that rhizosphere, those things build up, they can poison the plant and contaminate the final product. So if you design your systems correctly to allow runoff, not as much of a need for all these fancy flushings, or let's use aloe, or let's use yucca, or microflush, or hydrogen peroxide at the end, you'll see millions of products for sale to do this, but really like, most of those are not necessary. I mean, for almost any level of cannabis cultivation, unless you're totally salt-based, then you need to be life support. But if you've got the right systems, like, flushing is not as adequately important. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for our cultivation panel. That was awesome, you guys. That was highly informative. Thank you so much. Thank you guys so much for